I don't think very many of the air crew knew what strategic bombing really meant. We as boys from school joined the Air Force because there was a war being fought and there was a bit of glamour attached to the Air Force. If you couldn't get the Kraut uh, in his factory, it was just as easy to knock him off in his bed. And uh, if old Granny uh, Schickelgruber in the street next door got the chop, that's hard luck. There are a lot of people who say that bombing can never win a war. Well, my answer to that is that it has never been tried yet, and we shall see. After the Battle of Britain, the Royal Air Force had cause to celebrate. Fighter Command had shown how difficult it was for bombers to destroy a country which could defend its own airspace. A lesson the air staff apparently neglected to teach itself. Lord Trenchard had founded the service as a force of strategic bombers. Fighters for defense were secondary. Long-range bombers, it was argued in the 30s, could win wars without costly land battles. They would bomb the industrial heart out of an enemy and totally demoralize his civilian population. In 1939, the RAF was not really equipped to put this thesis to the test. But after Dunkirk, it was the only force capable of attacking Germany. And the British public desperately needed an attack. The British Empire is building up a tremendous bomber force designed as the offensive air weapon to smash the heart of Germany. The first daylight raids were disastrous. Bombers fell easy prey to the Luftwaffe. Still the RAF persevered, though losses mounted. Heavy casualties forced Bomber Command to start flying at night. Said, how can you miss them? And I leave you to guess what I said. Okay, chaps, here we go. Hello, Steve Charlie. Hello, Steve Charlie. Bar dancing, bar dancing. You have to make every out and take off. Oh, dirty yellow stick. 
For air crews trained to attack in broad daylight, night flying had its problem. To find a, a target in Germany in the dead of night, in any average weather conditions, was quite far beyond the task of any bomber crews. The Dutch coast, too much cloud to see where. Patriotic films had no difficulty in giving the impression that pluck and determination and a diet of raw carrots could overcome the law that says you cannot see in the dark. Can't be anything else but the right. I hope something on you. Keep on going. You may be able to pick up something different later on. Uh, if you could get visual pinpoints en route, uh, you could get within five or seven miles of the target. Some doors open. Steady. Of course, once the target was reached, it was a piece of cake. Bomb's gone. Provided you were just blowing up a studio model. I hope we haven't kept you waiting, sir. Good Lord, now. Come and sit down. Well, how'd you get on? Caused a hell of a great big fire. Buckets of smoke. Visible, ooh, 50 miles away. Well, old boy, how about some bacon and eggs? The truth was different. In fact, in those days, and it's proved, it's been proved since, uh, three bombs in every hundred got within five miles of the aiming point. In diesem Schlafsaal wurden neun Kinder getötet und fünf schwer verletzt. Inaccurate bombing could be embarrassing. The German propaganda ministry was quick to capitalize on the destruction of this children's hospital. Das sind die Opfer der britischen Mordbuben, die dieses gemeine Verbrechen ganz bewusst begangen haben. Es wird unerbittlich gesühnt werden. But the war cabinet's view was that Germany had to be bombed. And this was the only strategic bombing Britain could then undertake. Coventry in Liverpool indicated that German industry would suffer if its workers were bombed out. Professor Lindemann was advising Churchill that de-housing one-third of German workers would bring industrial production to a halt. And there was popular pressure to avenge the Blitz. We ask no favors of the enemy. We seek from them no compunction. On the contrary, if tonight the people of London were asked to cast their votes as to whether a convention should be entered into to stop the bombing of all cities, an overwhelming majority would cry, no, we will mete out to the Germans the measure, and more than the measure, they have meted out to us. The Germans were now meeting it out to the British bomber. By the end of 1941, Britain had lost 700 aircraft. The Navy and the Army were demanding bombers for the Atlantic and the desert. Bomber Command stood to be put out of business. In the face of mounting losses, the Cabinet ordered bombing operations to be cut down to save the bomber force. During the respite in February 1942, Sir Arthur Harris took over as Commander-in-Chief Bomber Command. He was determined to succeed with new tactics and new bombers. The Nazis entered this war under the rather childish delusion that they were going to bomb everybody else and nobody was going to bomb them. At uh, Rotterdam, 
in London, Warsaw, and half a hundred other places, they put that rather naive theory into operation. They sowed the wind, and now they are going to reap the whirlwind. I put them onto the North German ports in the Baltic because uh, uh, having flown a, quite a bit at night myself, I realized that uh, the easiest targets to get hold of, of course, were always the ones on the coastline. Because if you can see anything, you can see a coastline. And if you can see a coastline with its odd shapes, you can find your way along to uh, ports and recognize them. Lübeck and Rostock were the first major targets. As ports, they were easy to find, and they burnt well. In March 1942, 230 bombers destroyed half Lübeck. In April, Rostock was bombed into flame. The style was set, night area bombing. This was to become the pattern for the next three years. It was terrifying, it was indiscriminate, but as far as bomber command was concerned, there was no alternative. How many occasions, looking out of the window or walking out in the garden, could you see up to 18 or 20,000 feet? Maybe on two or three days at most. On how many occasions can you guarantee if you could see up to it here, that you could see down to it? four or five hundred miles away in the other end of Europe. That was the situation. There's no possibility of hitting individual targets, consistently small targets, until we'd got the navigational electronic aids that would show those targets up in the dark or through clouds. The first electronic aid to navigation now came into service was called G. Three radio transmitters in England sent out an invisible grid of signals across Western Europe. By monitoring the signals and plotting them on a map, a navigator could tell where his aircraft was. G was first used at Cologne. Here, Harris threw in every bomber he could scrape up for a monumental prestige attack. In your hands lie the means of destroying a major part of the resources by which the enemy's war effort is maintained. Press home your attack. If you individually succeed, you will have delivered the most devastating blow against the very vitals of the enemy. Let him have it right on the chin. Send that message to all groups and stations. Well, I was trying to show then what could be achieved with something approaching an adequate force and that it would uh, be achieved without abnormal casualties. The hours of darkness over Hitler's Germany are about to be made hideous. The men of Bomber Command know well what they have to do. A calm, moonlit night. Everything ready and waiting, from planes to carrier pigeons. They seem to know the ops are on. Come on, fellas, get cracking. Round the clock with the RAF. At station after station, there are heavies, including Lancaster's, the heavy bomber of the moment, ready for tonight. For tonight is going to be very, very interesting. A thousand bomber night. On that night, the 30th of May, 1942, 1,046 bombers took off for Cologne. We heard auch gleich kurz darauf das Brummen der anfliegenden Bombe. We heard the drone of the approaching bombers and guessed that it was a heavy formation. Und uh, bald darauf flogen die ersten Bomben in unmittelbarer Nähe. And soon after, the first bombs fell around us. 
We were all shaking with fear. Some people nearly fainted. Many of the patients were crying. The roaring and crashing came closer and closer. We really thought all hell was breaking loose. Our part of the city was in flames. People were running out of cellars and out of houses. Some were buried in the rubble. Others were caught by the falling masonry. Many people actually caught fire and were running around like living torches. We really didn't expect in 42 that such a heavy raid would take place. We were only used to smaller attacks. And uh, when I got the news that uh, about 1,000 bombers were attacking Cologne, uh, it was incredible. Uh, the morale of the people was not shattered too much. Uh, it was more like a, a short shock which passed away. German industry remained resilient, although the Ruhr, the industrial heartland, was under attack throughout 1942. Damage was extensive, but there was still some slack in the economy to be taken up in more war production. The Nazi war machine was skilled at orchestrating civilian morale. And the Germans could give as well as take. The Luftwaffe was acutely aware of the lesson radar controlled RAF fighters had taught it during the Battle of Britain. Air Defense Chief General Kamhuber evolved a most efficient system. Across the North Sea coast stretched an early warning radar grid, the Kamhuber line. This grid was divided into boxes. In each box was a night fighter waiting like a spider for the fly. We overtook the plane on the side, so he thought, ah, he hasn't seen me. He still did some corkscrewing or waving. I just banked slightly to give the gunners a good view underneath. I moved off maybe 10 degrees to port and starboard during this maneuver, but it wasn't violent in any sense at all. And then I was shooting this way and diving directly, or with the, what we said, schräge Musik, two, two centimeters, cannons, the same, only flying underneath and waiting, the moving, very easy, we did the same parallel to the other one, shooting and between the motors. You had about 5,000 uh, liters of gasoline and that was burning very easily. The advent of the Camp Huber line and uh, all that went with it uh, was a startling sort of thing to be confronted with because they took, uh, the German night defences took a terrible toll of British bombers. But now the RAF was no longer alone. There's your bird seat for Hitler. Come and get it. Throughout 1942, the United States 8th Army Air Force had been building up in England. The American air chiefs believed they could succeed in daylight without suffering the losses the British had done. They were convinced they could bomb accurately by day. Uh, 
aircraft were very heavily armed. Some carried up to 12 machine guns and they were trained to fly in close formation. Formation flying was really the name of the game as far as the 8th Air Force was concerned. The, the, there's never anything like it happened before or since. And, uh, uh, they, they, they actually were sort of making their own rules up as they went along because it was just a brand new concept. You uh, m made it possible to have a more concentrated firepower from the gunner's positions of all your airplanes. Uh, the fact that you could depend on good formation, tight formation, uh, not only helped you, uh, in defense of fighter attack, uh, it made your uh, chances of achieving, achieving good bombing results much better. Because if you're bombing a squadron of airplanes was bombing and the, the pattern was a good tight pattern, uh, your results were uh, bound to be uh, bound to be good. Early raids into France seemed to bear out the American optimism. Later, over Germany, it was a different story. But they found that at first, yes, the bombers could cope pretty well with the fighters and take acceptable losses on if the penetrations were not too deep. And uh, the bombers kept good formation and they had the supporting fire one from the other. But uh, as time went on, the Germans were learning too. And so they learned how to make their attacks and they learned how to penetrate the formations and they started the head-on attacks which were uh, try to get the leader and spread out the formation. And once they got the formation spread out, then they could pick the uh, bombers off at will, more or less, anyway. But it was too early to admit defeat. At night, the British bombers flew on, hundreds at a time, but each on its own. Well, when we used to see them go over in the early evening, one by one in trail, uh, I, uh, I would not have changed places for them. And I'd much rather have the close formation, the firepower, uh, than go over the way they did. Where well, when you're flying with the RAF, you were single Charlie. Just after we'd crossed the Dutch coast, uh, I felt a terrific bang in my face and the windscreen was shot away and um, been sort of wounded in the forearm the head and uh, the shoulder in the head and the plane went out of control temporarily. So I didn't see any sense in saying, you know, that I'm wounded in case they all thought, you know, he's going to pop off any minute now. And... Well, the candle again exploded in the front of the plane, up in the beside us and the shell hit the engineer who stood beside me in the forearm and I had bits in my leg and they sort of skinned my skin off my hand. The port elevator had been shot off the plane. That's the elevator that keeps the plane straight and level on each side of the till. And the port one had been shot off. And this meant that you had to hold the stick back, right back as if you were going to climb like this to keep the plane straight and level. So the bombing one had to help push this back as well because my, my shoulder was, my, this hand was pretty weak, my shoulder being hit. And it was a matter of keeping the stick back by holding my hands in front. And the engineer held it with his other hand, his good arm. So we held this combined back um, to keep the plane straight and level. And it wasn't a sort of press on the guarders feeling. It was just a, a fact that the four engines were still flying. Uh, if we'd had any engine cut, I'd have thought right away, well, we can't get any further. Uh, but the another factor here was that had I turned back, we have another six or seven hundred planes that are more or less in the same track and spread with something like eight or ten miles broad and maybe what, four to six thousand feet deep. And you're right, you're turning back right into them and you're heading right down through this lot to get back. 
uh, and then again had a turned off, say, 90 degrees to try and avoid them, you're still turning across quite a number of them. And then I watched for the target indicators and opened the bomb doors and kept the plane as steady as I could on the target indicators and then just kept a straight level. And I think this is probably one of the things that made the fuss about that we had a picture of the actual target, you know, after all this happening. Um, but as soon as we had a picture taken, I turned off to head for, for base. One of the things that I always remember feeling in this particular trip was that we had to get back because I knew we were wounded. None of the other members could fly it, you know, even normal straight and level. So to fly it at night with one elevator gone and uh, having to stick back in your belly and no instruments, as it were, would have been pretty well impossible. And we were shot at a few times on the way back, but we weren't hit again. Uh, and eventually we did come over England when I saw these beacons flashing. touched down, the old, old the legs of the undercarriage collapsed and along their belly for maybe 50 yards or so and came to a stop, switched off engines to keep the fire hazard down. Um, it was then only that I knew the navigator was killed because he had slid forward beside me. I couldn't keep track of them, sir, but I can by 65. Well, I stopped trying to count when I got to 50, sir. I think it was generally understood that the combat tour was 25 missions because uh, you'd be dead by the end of that time, so there wasn't any point in asking you to stay around any longer. Bomber crews lived a curious war. One day in action, the next on the town. When uh, would our group wasn't flying, they'd usually go into London uh, spend the day in London and sometimes uh, if they had some money left they'd call up to find out whether or not there was a, a mission going the next day and if not they stay over. Flak will be heavy, probably accurate. You've been through worse before. Remember that your biggest enemy is still a single engine fighter plane. I recall one uh, evening in the officers' club, our operations officer was pouring scotch into a one-armed bandit, you know, these things that you put quarters in, <laughs> trying to persuade the machine to deliver a jackpot. <laughs> but uh, uh, the, I guess it was a kind of an eat, drink, and be merry uh, a sort of uh, life. to be rough. You're going to have to bow your neck in there and stay in there and pitch every minute. I think that uh, flying is so impersonal, that is to say combat flying, that you don't get that intimate sense of loss if you see an airplane get shot down that you'd have if, you, if your buddy on a battlefield uh, had his head blown off right within arm's length. Young men came from Britain, America, occupied Europe and the British Commonwealth to fight and die in the most determined air offensive yet waged. In January 1943 at Casablanca, Churchill and Roosevelt decided to combine the British and American bombing efforts in preparing Nazi Europe for D-Day. U-boat yards, aircraft plants, armament factories, Oil installations and transport were deemed priority targets for round-the-clock precision bombing.
But precision bombing at night was still impossible for Harris. An attempt to pick off the Ruhr dams with specially designed bombs was only partially successful and cost the lives of some of the best air crews. Though the raid led to improved accuracy later on, not all the dams were hit. Ruhr arms production was unaffected. Harris believed that only the mounting onslaught of night area bombing would crush German industrial capacity. At this time, uh, we were getting better aircraft. The Lancaster was coming out in great numbers. We were losing the, the lesser efficient Stirling and the Halifax. We were getting better radar devices. And uh, we had extremely good navigators, selected navigators. And this was the essence of the whole thing. And these navigators uh, were able to get much closer to a naming point than we had previously. Then we laid great lanes of flares, hundreds of flares. Even if we missed the aiming point, we would identify some very positive uh, uh, feature on the ground, like a lake uh, or a bend in the river. And from there, we could then creep onto the target and put flares down, and different colored flares. And then later on, we got target indicators. And these uh, were just imagine a, a great bunch of incandescent grapes falling from 2,000, 4,000, wherever we, we wanted them to, to detonate from. At the end of July 1943, Harris deployed his improving technology with devastating effect on Hamburg. The effectiveness of the first Hamburg raid was due to us at last getting permission to use something we'd had in the bag for a long time, which was known as window, which was the dropping of clouds of aluminium paper strips, which completely upset not only the German location apparatus, but also their gun aiming apparatus. None of us, neither civilians nor firemen, knew what happened in this night. It was a very heavy raid, but we had almost uh, the same one year before. We were not prepared for the firestorm, which broke out half an hour after the raid. The effect of the bombing, combined with a summer heat wave, was to create a man-made tornado of flame, a firestorm. And uh, this ganze Gegend wurde von Kanälen. I went to this area near the docks. It was crossed by canals. People tried to leap down into them out of the flames, but the water was on fire. Das Wasser brannte. It's difficult to explain why the water was burning. There were many ships, small ships, moored in the canals. They had exploded and burning oil had been released onto the water. And the people who were themselves on fire jumped into it. And they burnt, swam, burnt and went under. Most people were killed by the fierce heat uh, not burned or suffocated or poisoned by carbon monoxide. We think that in some places the temperature 
uh, reached a thousand degrees um, centigrade. The British night attacks and American day raids lasted nearly a week. 30,000 died. In uh, Hamburg, we really uh, uh, found out the first time that the morale of the German people uh, can be shattered so much that the work uh, for industry, the work in the armaments industry, would uh, collapse. At the time, Speer said that six more raids like that would have finished the war. The Allies did not have that capacity. The shock passed. At the same time, the 8th Air Force had stepped up the intensity of its daylight raids against precise targets. This group will bomb from an altitude of 13,000 feet. We feel that this low altitude will be equalized by the element of surprise which is with us. Two weeks after Hamburg, they planned to deal their knockout blow against German industry. Lights, please. This group of buildings here is your target. This building will be the aiming point. If your bomb pattern is concentrated in this area, it should very effectively knock out the factory. The target was the ball bearing factories at Schweinfurt, producing a major part of Germany's need. The attacking force was to be split into two. The first wave would fight to a secondary target, the Messerschmitt aircraft plant at Regensburg. Then it would fly on unhindered to North Africa. The second wave, 10 minutes behind the first, would then arrive at Schweinfurt whilst the German fighters were on the ground refueling. Their battle would be during the trip home. We went in. I went in without any fighter escort at all and flew clear across uh, Europe uh, without fighter escort with about 125 airplanes that I had in the division at the time. The astonished German air defense staff plotted the path of the first wave as it flew further and further into Germany. They could not tell the plan was going wrong. British weather helped to upset the Americans' careful plans. Unexpected low cloud delayed the takeoff of the second wave. The result, the Luftwaffe, refueled and rearmed, was waiting for them. Well, we didn't expect an attack coming that far into the country without fighter escort. And um, we were all very astonished. <laughs> Victor, Victor! Schweinfurt has been the result of very good conditions in favor of the German fighters and the fact that we could bring about all our fighters uh, in operation to intercept the bomber stream. This all together has uh, favored our um, results. Twenty-one flying fortresses were lost before the first bomb fell on Schweinfurt. First 
Division coming in later had uh, heavier losses because they had to go back out in addition to coming in. Uh, so I think we wound up the day by losing about 60 airplanes, which uh, didn't make anybody very happy. cost was high, but ball-bearing production was disrupted for six weeks. When uh, you uh, uh, hit uh, Schweinfurt uh, first, it was a uh, nightmare getting through. But uh, then I had a very good representative, Kessler, and he um, did with all means not only the repair, but also replacement of ball bearings with other uh, other um, devices which uh, uh, could do the job not as good as a ball bearing but it could be done. In the two-wave attack over 120 aircraft were lost or damaged beyond repair. To prove their point at Schweinfurt the Americans would have to go back. Naturally I was keenly disappointed largely because in sending my uh, crews back, I knew they would sustain additional losses. And if we had done the job right in the first place, we could have avoided these losses. But uh, uh, nobody who fires a gun hits uh, his target every time. We went back because we got a period of good weather, and it was our highest priority target. And uh, that's why we returned. On the 14th of October, some 300 bombers were marshaled over England. There were airplanes climbing all over England. England was just an airport, really. And uh, this, I think, was, was real difficult. It took some time to group a large number of heavy bombers into a tight formation. These complicated maneuvers gave ample warning to the Luftwaffe of the strength and direction of an attacking force. Two-thirds of all German fighters were now concentrated against the 8th Air Force. Well, the fighter, he was the boogeyman. Uh, the fighter had eyes, and uh, in a great many instances, uh, the fighter had a pretty confident fella uh, at the controls. And when he latched on to you, uh, you, you, were in, you were in trouble lots of time. And I was that close that I could really see the rear gun, and uh, I saw him frightened as I was. They'd call the positions of the fighters out over their uh, intercom, you see, and sometimes they'd get so frightened that they'd continue to hold the microphone down and keep hollering into the microphone. And uh, they started by 1,000 meters, almost, with their tracing ammunition in order to frighten us. And I told my young, younger pilots, who had no experience, to close their eyes, attacking from behind. Well, there wasn't very much time to think. You just uh, put that gun sight on what kept waving your head around in the sky looking for enemy fighters and kept the gun sight on them. Uh, right before we hit the target uh, was the worst part of the ride. We got picked up by fighters and were taken into the target and then they left and we dropped the bombs and they took us, uh, picked us up after the target. More than 60% of all ball-bearing production at Schweinfurt was destroyed. The Americans had lost more than 60 flying fortresses. If you would have repeated those raids shortly afterwards and wouldn't have given us the time to rebuild, 
uh, then uh, it would have been a disastrous result. But could you take the losses that the forces took when you didn't know whether you were going to accomplish it or not, when you thought ball bearings were coming in from Sweden and you possibly through Switzerland? So you didn't know, so you, you don't go on with those things. So the strategy swung back from pinpoint targets like Schweinfurt to another night area offensive, Berlin. With American support, Harris believed he could wreck Berlin in six months and win the war. But the depleted 8th Air Force were not now able to join him. He sent the most amazing signals, and one that I'll always remember, and this is the sort of thing you read out to your crews at briefing. Uh, this one went on to say, tonight you go to the big city, that's Berlin, you have the opportunity to light a fire in the belly of the enemy and burn his black heart out. Well, when crews, <laughs> after they stopped cheering a thing like that, they didn't want aircraft. They would just fill their pockets with bombs and point them towards Berlin and they'd take off on their own. Bomber Command had to go on, on its own. It was a long way, and the weather at the end of 1943 was particularly bad. But each night, the bombers fought their way to Berlin and other cities deep in Germany. Harris's crews wrought terrible damage. Berlin is getting a real taste of total war. The terrific weight of the RAF assaults on the capital of Nazi land has set the Hun reeling. How he must regret the ruthless attacks he made on Warsaw, Rotterdam, Belgrade, London, Coventry and the rest. The day and night of reckoning is here. And what do you think of it, Keith? Well, I think Jerry definitely had it this time. Certainly was a wizard praying. Yet many of Berlin's offices and factories managed to go on working. In my uh, experience, uh, people uh, rather got uh, numb. Uh, they were uh, going through the streets like shadows, but they were still working like, like automats. very little trouble in getting there. But one thing I did notice was the vicious way in which every German town now seems to throw up flak indiscriminately. The technological advantages which prevailed over Hamburg no longer apply. The German air defense had leapfrogged ahead once more. Berlin looked as if it would indeed remain Berlin. By early spring 1944, Harris had not totally destroyed the city. Bomber command had been savagely mauled by the Germans. 
In those four months, in raids against Berlin and other targets, a thousand aircraft, the command's first line strength, were lost. But Harris did not, and does not, concede defeat. The casualties in the Battle of Berlin were no more than we would have uh, suffered if we'd gone anywhere else in Germany, deep into Germany. Uh, people seem to forget that Bomber Command fought a, fought a thousand battles during the war. You can't succeed in every one. I'm not saying the Battle of Berlin was a defeat or anything like a defeat. I think it was a major contribution towards the defeat of Germany. There were thousands of anti -air, heavy anti-aircraft guns, millions of, um, of uh, ammunition for it, and uh, hundreds of thousands of soldiers which were torn away from our fight in the Eastern Front. So I should say, with um, air attacks on Germany, you had in an early state from 43 on, really a so-called Second Front. Despite all the devastation, the Germans carried on. German industry was still supplying the armies fighting fiercely in the East and in Italy. The strategic bombing thesis remained as yet unproven. The lessons of Schweinfurt have been well learned by the Americans. Re-equipped, they joined the RAF over Berlin in March 1944, but now they were escorted by the Mustang, a remarkable aeroplane which was to change everything. It had a bomber's range of the fighter's performance. The German day fighter had now met its man. By the end of spring 1944, the German day fighter had lost where the Spitfire and Hurricane had won. The Americans had finally beaten the Luftwaffe over daylight Europe with their long-range fighters. And we had nothing um, of the same effort. And uh, I think they, they frightened us quite a bit. I think the main concern was the quantities that they show, were showing up. Germans had lost control of their airspace in daylight. From now on, the Allies would be able to launch day raids over Germany at will. But in March 1944, both bomber forces were placed under Eisenhower's overall command to prepare for D-Day. There would be six months respite before the Allied bombers could set out once more to break the will of the German people. 